And joining us now to talk about your health is Dr. Joshua Starr, primary care provider, at University of Maryland, Baltimore, Washington Medical Center. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us. It is Men's Health Month. So at the outset here, give us a couple of things that you want all men to uh, be thinking about. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me, Jeff. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and share some basic information with your viewers and listeners. Um, I think uh, first and foremost, um, having a doctor on a regular basis uh, is, I think, an important thing for men and anyone in general as they get older, but particularly men, for whatever reason, we have a tendency to avoid doctors. Um, and I think that uh, we have a tendency to self-diagnose like a lot of people. So I think having a, a medical doctor to bounce some ideas off of, ask questions, and follow up on a regular basis is uh, a really good idea, in my opinion. Um, some other basic things I think that are important as well, uh, regular physical activity. Um, we got to move. We, uh, we spend too much time sitting, and we all have, I think, far too sedentary jobs. So movement you know, is something that I really try to talk to my patients about. Some is better than none. Um, any type of movement is better than no movement. Um, so I think movement in general is really good. And then the last thing I think is really important as well is just, you know, make our own food as much as possible. Cook at home whenever you can, you know, buy whole ingredients, um, try to stay away from the processed stuff. I think those, those are pretty basic things that hopefully um, a lot of people can do on a regular basis. A lot of things we can dig into there. Let, let's start with the idea that men, more than women, tend to avoid going to the doctor. Is it because it costs money? Is it because sometimes it's invasive, it, you know, it may hurt? Is it a, a masculinity thing? Why do we do that? I think it's like a lot of things in life, uh, multifactorial, right? Um, I think there's a, it depends on the individual, it depends on where they're from, depends what culture they grew up in, it depends on their family unit, personal experiences that they've had, how they tend to cope with stressful situations. Um, I believe there was a study uh, looking at Hispanic um, adults um, by the Pew Research Group recently that showed that about 50% found it challenging to find a doctor, um, found the whole process of trying to find a medical professional to be daunting. So um, I think culture plays a role. Uh, as I said, I think coping mechanisms, we all, not we all, but I think a lot of people tend to use avoidance as a coping mechanism, whether that's because of a personal experience they had with a doctor um, or the medical system or a family member's personal experience with the medical system, or they're just afraid, you know, or they're in denial of some sort of symptom and, and they'd rather not address it and they'd rather just avoid it. I think that uh, uh, time plays a huge role as well. I'm a, I'm a parent, I'm a husband, um, you know, I work full time and time is at a premium. So it is very challenging to carve out some space in my day or I make it seem like it's more challenging than it is. Um, I think we have to put a priority on our health. So Maybe. far too often, it's just, it's, just, it's just not a priority. You mentioned the importance of actually having a doctor. Primary care has, has changed a lot. I mean, it's become a little bit more of a factor. You're seeing a lot more physicians, assistants, nurse practitioners. You're, you're a young doctor. You chose family medicine in, in medical school. Why did you do that? Uh, there's a, there's a several answers to that question, I think. Um, one is that it's, it's, it's incredibly varied. I, I don't like doing the same thing every day. Um, I like some variety in my life. So uh, I think doing the same thing for an entire work day, for an entire week, for the rest of my life would just bore me to death. So family medicine definitely has that variety, which I enjoy. Um, I also think that uh, I, it, there's a personal touch, I think, that I try to give uh, in my practice as well. Just having conversations with people, getting to know people, developing a rapport that I don't think you can get in every in, in certain specialties, let's say. It's not to say that you can't get them, but just for me, family medicine uh, just sort of spoke to me in, uh, for those reasons. Yeah, and I don't mean to, to diminish the importance of nurse practitioners. They're hugely important. And, and probably, you know, if you got a strep throat or something, they've probably seen more of it than anybody else, right? But the, the importance of having, maybe it's not going to be an individual these days. Maybe it's going to be a, a practice that, that you can become a patient of, and you get to know the people at the front desk, and, and that gets you on the path to, to uh, greater health, greater medical care. 
you know, I um, I trained in uh, I trained in Illinois. I actually grew up in Canada. Um, I uh, I practiced medicine in Canada. I had my own practice for a handful of years before I, I ultimately moved uh, back to the area to be closer to my wife's family and you know help raise our children and everything. Uh, so I've seen both sides of healthcare. Um, you know, I would agree in some respects it does seem a little more. Um, like a factory, as you said, um, maybe a little depersonalized at times. Um, I think uh, EMRs and, and, and information sharing certainly helps doctors who are maybe not your primary care doctor, but work at the same office, access to your medical information and get to know you a little bit. So there is a little bit of a history there, but I would agree with some of those things um, that it is a little bit of a challenge. Um, members of minority groups, um, clearly, frequently, study after study, have um, worse outcomes, have, uh, are more susceptible to some common problems. In, in your practice, um, do you see that? What, what factors can you think about there, and, and how should we address those disparities? Uh, well, that's, uh, that's probably a little bit more than just a medical question. I think there's a number of different factors that lead to some of the uh, disparities, you know, across cultures in, 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 uh, in the United States and in other countries as well. Um, again, I think some of them are particular to certain, um, you know, ethnic backgrounds. Uh, Hispanics, for instance, they, they're, they have a culture that is, tends to be a little more uh, we keep some of our medical information to ourselves. We don't tend to go see a doctor. Certainly, there are some, you know, uh, individual and cultural differences amongst uh, amongst groups. Um, I also think that there's, again, you know, you. I think you like to see people, in general. I, at least I see a lot of people in my practice that like to see me because I'm young, because. Um, you know, and I tend to see a lot of young men because they want a doctor that that looks like them, that, you know, is experiencing maybe some of the same um, medical problems as them or life challenges as them. So I think um, in part, maybe it's 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 there's there aren't enough uh, 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 doctors that have certain, you know, uh, uh, backgrounds that maybe somebody can relate to. Um, uh, so I think that that plays a role as well. Um, and then and there's a number of other factors, I think, that go beyond, I think, just the, you know, the medical side of things that I think that uh, uh, can play a role for sure. Do you, do you find that, that men come in and, and talk about a symptom and it didn't start yesterday, it started, <laughs> you know, nine months ago and they're, they're just now either getting up the courage or finding the, the time to confront it? Is there any other way that men present with symptoms? I feel like that is the main way that men come in with symptoms. I, I, I commonly hear this, and I've experienced this myself in my own personal life. You know, if that's if that symptom's there next month or next week, you know, maybe when I have a little more time or if it gets worse, I'll go see the doctor. And uh, uh, that's that's all too common. I agree. I think it's, it's all too common for men in their 30s and 40s and sometimes even 50s to come in and see me and say, I've never had a primary care doctor in my life before. So you wonder, how can somebody's um, partner, family member encourage somebody Maybe they know there's a symptom, maybe they don't, but, you know, they, they know this person has, has never seen a doctor. They have no idea what the blood pressure might be, what other issues might be lurking. I'm wondering what, what you could say that, that would have a positive impact and, and wouldn't, um, you know, backfire because, you know, guys, we don't really like being told what to do either. Yeah, right. Yeah, you can run the danger of being a little pushy. Um, well, I think that continuing to, you know, I mean, it's a fine line for sure. You don't want to be um, annoying. You don't want to be bothering the person. But I think at the same time, you know, uh, it, it's, it's important to, to make sure that they understand that there's health is, should be a priority, that there are conditions that exist that may not have any symptoms. Uh, one that comes to mind that I deal with all the time is high blood pressure. Um, I try to explain to people that you're probably not going to know that your blood pressure is too high or too low unless it's through the roof and sky high or in the toilet, conversely, and incredibly low. So that leaves a lot of variability, variability in between. And um, I mean, I, I think there's a reason why um, it is a silent disease in a lot of cases, because you're not going to know if it's high or low or affecting any of your organ systems or anything like that. All right, let's, uh, let's um, boil this down a little bit for maybe three categories. This may be too broad, but young guys, middle-aged guys, older guys. What, what um, screenings, um, 
what basic checkup stuff would be reasonable in those categories? Again, I'll, I'll say that it should be individualized um, um, based on you know age and demographics and you know backgrounds and family history. I think for young men, it's important just to kind of get your foot in the door and and establish with a primary care doctor. You know, I think a lot of people come in and it's again it, maybe the last doctor they saw was their pediatrician because their parents were setting up the appointments for them. Um, so I think when you're young in your 20s and 30s. Uh, it's important to just get established with a primary care doctor um, and, 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 and just come in for a checkup. Talk to them about maybe some small things that might be on your mind, maybe you don't think are necessarily concerning, but let the doctor be the judge. I think I try to err on, on the side of caution and just tell patients, listen, I would rather you come in with a silly question to talk to me for a few minutes, then it, let it go and, and, and months down the road or years down the road, it turns into a big issue because you never mentioned anything in the first place. So I think just getting your foot in the door is important. Um, I think as you get older into middle age, some health screenings that are important um, can be things like uh, colon cancer screening. I think that would probably be my number one thing um, because uh, it's a top three cancer in the United States. Um, and we have very good screening tools for assessing whether or not uh, somebody is at risk or has developed early stages of colon cancer. So. Um, that one definitely uh, typically starts at the age of 45. It used to be 50. And we have traditional screening tools such as a colonoscopy. Um, and we also have a little newer um, uh, screening tools such as uh, Cologuard testing or FIT testing um, that, are, uh, that can be done a little less invasively from the comfort of your own home. Uh, I would say that uh, some other types of screenings um, can be things such as prostate cancer screening for the right individual. Um, we know that rates are higher in African-American men, and we also know that rates are higher in people that have a family history of prostate cancer. Uh, I think that if you're a smoker, uh, you can certainly talk to your doctor about lung cancer screening, which is a newer uh, screening tool that we have for certain individuals who have smoked for a period of time. And I also think that skin cancer screening is, is, is a useful thing as well, depending on the individual. Again, I think we do most of our damage to our skin, most damage to our bodies, to be perfectly honest, at a young age before we know any better. Um, uh, but I think that that follows suit with uh, with skin cancer screening as well. Um, I think one thing I wanted to mention and, and, and should note uh, with, with regards to screening tests is that screening tests are, are by nature for people who have no symptoms. Screening tests are not in, uh, investigative. If you were to come into your doctor and say, I'm having chest pain or shortness of breath, and we were to run a test on your heart, that would no longer necessarily be considered a screening test. That's more of a diagnostic test. So I think certain symptoms should definitely be mentioned to your doctor as well. Things like, as I mentioned, chest pain, shortness of breath, changes to your energy level, fatigue, um, changes to your weight, especially if they're unexplained and you've made no changes to your exercise routine or your dietary habits, changes to your urinary habits as well, I think, especially as you get older. Um, but uh, I, again, I, I really just want to emphasize the importance of, of regularly touching base with your doctor. I think that that's an important screening tool in and of itself. Dr. Joshua Starr joining us from the University of Maryland, Baltimore, Washington Medical Center. Doctor, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Your health segments are a co-production of Maryland Public Television and the University of Maryland Medical System.